this just came out the last week, but um, Oregon State had pursued the defund the police policy, the yeah. decriminalized drugs policy, and there's now this dramatic reversal. Because guess what? When you let people shoot up heroin on the side of the road, snort meth uh, in tents, uh, downtown Portland, um, it actually is not good for society. And there's such this dramatic pushback. And I was actually shocked to see it that Oregon lawmakers, all Democrats, of course, um, said, you know what? We've gone too far. Let's bring it back to the center. And I think that's something that's very good. It's definitely very good. It is a little shocking that they figured it out. It just doesn't seem like, like when you go and drive through Oakland, for example, it doesn't seem like anybody's trying to put a cork on that. They're just like letting it be insanely chaotic. Like the areas where they have the shanty town set up and people have tents everywhere and these makeshift structures. How? At what point in time do you stop letting these open air drug dens exist where people are just cooking meth in front of everybody? That just seems so insane. So it's nice to see that Oregon's like, hey, let's hit the brakes. Yeah. Is it all drugs now? Did they just put everything in the same category? Which is also quite insane. Yeah, I mean, no, it's not all drugs, it obviously. It just says it right here? Yeah. It says, the measure makes the possession of small amount of drugs, such as heroin or methamphetamine, a misdemeanor, pun punishable by up to six months in jail. It enables police to confiscate the drugs and crack down on their use on sidewalks and in parks. But what about, what are the other, see, the thing is, it, it basically, what Oregon did is decriminalize almost everything. The weird thing about drugs is you throw them all into one blanket. You know, you throw, you cover them all with one blanket, drugs. Because caffeine's a drug. Alcohol's a drug. There's a lot of drugs that we're accustomed to, to using. And I'm not necessarily in favor of those being illegal. And when you, um, you add in heroin and methamphetamine to something that we're already accustomed to, like alcohol or caffeine, it's like, what, what do, are we, you know... The, why are these the same things? Like, why don't you just individually say yeah. the fentanyl is unbelievably bad for you? Marijuana, not so much. Let's, like, figure out which ones are okay and which ones are not instead of just saying drugs. A hundred percent. I mean, you just have to do a really simple calculation. You say, is this drug correlated with extreme social pathology? Does it obliterate the individual? Does it cause social problems, social chaos? Um, and then you could categorize them very simply. Yes and no. Okay, you have alcohol, caffeine, marijuana. You can have a functioning society where those are used. Yeah. But you can't have a functioning society where people are foiling fentanyl. Um, and especially if you look at the, the, the cities, it's wrecked these cities. The big problem, though, is that the political left in the United States has lost the a willingness and the capacity to say no. Um, this is something we've all seen. You know, we're raised uh, a generation of kids where like saying no and imposing limits is something that you can't do. It's this idea of liberating ourselves from all limits. But, you know, some limits are necessary. Some limits are important. And so I think we're starting to finally see the consequences of obliterating limits. And then now we're starting to say, you know, in a reasonable way, we should start reimposing some guardrails. Well, that's one of the things you find out when you're a parent that seems counterintuitive. But one of the things you find out is that children are happier when you impose limitations on them, which sounds so crazy. But they are happier and they have less anxiety, apparently. Obviously, I'm not a doctor. Because they're, by having structure to life, it doesn't seem like everything is – like if they're in charge, like, oh, my God, I'm 12 and I'm in charge. I have no idea what's going on and I could stay out late all night. The world's chaos, <laughs> which it kind of is in some ways. But by imposing structure on them, it gives them comfort. And I find that's the case with human beings. I find that m the people that I know, even artists, even comedians and wild folks, the, the, the people that – have structure in their life, like have families and children and have like workout routines or things that they enjoy doing on a regular basis that they're very dedicated to. Those are the happiest people. They're the healthiest people. They're the people that seem to feel like there's a purpose to life. The purpose is your loved ones, your family, your community, the people you hang out with, the stuff you like to do, whatever it is, pickleball, whatever it is. That gives people like happiness and structure and this idea that having 
no uh, no limitations and complete freedom. And, you know, you want to, to be just just able to, like, fly away on a whim. Like, that doesn't promote happiness. Like, do, what are you trying to get out of this life? Don't you want it to be as enjoyable as possible? We've all had bad times. They suck. We try to avoid those. We try to have the good times. But... That can be applied to a society as well. The way you raise children can be applied to a society. Like, you need structure. You need rules. You need love and compassion. You need examples of good behavior. You need all of those things. And when you let people fucking cook meth in the middle of the street, that all goes out the window. Imagine being 12, drive by a fucking drug den every day on your way to school. You're like, oh, my God. What do I have to look forward to? Yeah, I mean, that was my life and my experience and observation. We moved out of Seattle in 2020, my wife, at that time, two kids, um, because of this precise phenomenon. The politics had gone totally sideways. Well, since um, Seattle in 2020 was particularly insane. It, particularly insane. That was it, the, 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 the area, what was it called? The what? glory of the Chaz. Chaz, yeah, that's the right. Chaz. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember... Um, our oldest son uh, was in kindergarten, first grade at the time, and uh, we would be walking to school a few blocks up, and we'd have to be avoiding schizophrenics, avoiding tents, avoiding people shooting up, avoiding people just shitting in the street. Walking. Walking. Just walking. Yeah. It's so just walking. Sketchy. And so, you know, you're trying to, to kind of navigate your kids around. There was a, a, a homeless encampment about 100 yards away from the school with probably 40 or 50 guys cooking drugs, stealing property, causing trouble. And then you talk to the administrators at the time, say, hey, this is a problem. I don't accept this. I don't like yeah. this. And they say, oh, well, you know, we have to be compassionate to our houseless neighbors. It's like, <sighs> no, we don't. This is a danger to kids. And it got so bad that they were teaching the kids what to do when they found hypodermic needles in the playground. Oh, my God. This is a problem. I don't want this as a parent. I want you to prevent them having to, to pick up hypodermic needles and... You know, and, and it's like a, a group of people that are so, it, it's like compassion also has to be limited. Yeah. You have to have compassion within reasonable limits. And well, you're also, us, you're it, dealing with people that'll just burn it all down. If you just allow, you say arson is no longer punishable, they'll burn all the houses down. Yeah. These are insane people. They don't have anything. Why wouldn't they just burn it all down just for funds? 